good after or good morning all and um, I'm going to just go straight into this because we're already short of time and um, this is, this is colour <laughs> oh. <laughs> I didn't think I'd have a moment with this but I did so <laughs> This is Carl, my grandchild, um, and he's pretty new. He's, he's, he's actually two years old now, but this is when he was born. Um, but I, I put him there because a lot of things that we're talking about today are pretty new. Abora culture, modern Abora culture is pretty new, and how it integrates into our, um, in a, into our decision making is also just very, very new. Um, and modern Abora culture is not the only thing that's new here. Um, you know, we've got. Uh, um, engineering and botany and all sorts of things like that. They've been around for hundreds of years. We know how to build roads and all sorts of things. But as, as Simon's pointing out too, we've come to a new era, a new, a new few decades that have actually bubbled up a lot of things. Development here in WA has really been the last 50, 60 years that we've, we've, we've you can see on the map here, just how far, how much has, has changed really in that period of time compared to the previous almost 100 years. Um, and modern Abora culture 30 years ago, and in fact it was myself and a few people that actually introduced Abora culture here into WA. Um, the digital age, it's, you know, we've got lots of experts now that are you know, digital gurus and have diplomas in all sorts of expertise from our, our wonderful um, uh, internet. Um, but relatively new, WUSID, only about to, in a couple of decades that that's really been part of things. Infill policy started about 10 years ago. In 10 years' time, we're going to end up with about double the, the uh, population of people in our inner suburbs here. Um, if it hasn't already happened, it's pretty close. But it, it sort of it puts pressure, really, on, on what our circumstance is. And just realising that in the last 30 years, we've really had a real, a, a, a real shift in, in the way things are being looked at. There's, there's uh, new sciences, there's new um, you know, things like the, the, Institute, the Landscape, Institute of Landscape Architects, for example. You know, th they've only been around a, a short period of time, formalised here only in, in recent decades. A lot of things have changed. We have urban ecology now that is a new science. But what we want is this sort of stuff. Um, but what we get generally looks something like this. Um, and at the end of the day, there's, there's you know, three to seven years of, of a life cycle of a, a lot of our trees. Well, the, half the trees that we plant, most of the time we're replacing them in three to seven years' time. And the other half, by often they're performing pretty much like this. Uh, we've, we've got you know, very, very poor performance. We're thinking this is still okay because it's still alive. Uh, but in actual fact, this is, you've got four trees here. One of them's um, barely surviving. It's going to die pretty shortly. And this is only seven years after, the, um, after planting. One of them that sort of looks like it might have a bit of a future. But even that's debatable. Most of the time, we end up with this sort of stuff. But, you know, and the, and the, the tragedy around this is that this three to seven year period, most of the time, that, that's actually um, at three, well, it's, it's after the time of what a landscape contract be, might be or a construction contract. Most of them finish within three years and the job's done. Everybody's signed off, but we come back you know, three, seven, ten years later and a large proportion of our landscape is actually looking like this down here. That's a, that's the reason we're having this conference is, is this really, there's so many people that are seeing this, they're agonising over this, I'm agonising over it, um, and, and it's why we're all here today. So it's, you know, it is really important. But in order to understand where it's come from, and Simon sort of mentioned this too, we've, we've really got three sets of circumstances that we're dealing with. These are trees that are, um, uh, already exist, trees that were um, uh, already in the landscape, and we've come along, they've been there for hundreds of years, we come along and we build things around them. Uh, and they ha they're natural, undisturbed soils, and we've got trees that have natural root systems that go with that too. Uh, and the other is but the new landscape that we're building, which we, you know, is what mainly we're talking about here today. Um, and there's new, so it's new root systems being introduced into what's a new soil environment as well. <coughs> Whether it's a small tree, a, um, a seedling, or a <coughs> pardon me, um, or a, the, like the transplanted uh, Kings Park. Uh, they're new root systems that need to establish. It takes them quite some years um, for that to happen. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Somebody grab a glass of water, yeah. Um, and, um, and, and thirdly, we've got... Thanks, Bob. And thirdly, we have what's really the inherited landscape. So there's already the, the, it's landscape that's 
trees have been planted in our urban spaces, they've adjusted to that, they've acclimatised, they've adapted to those soil conditions, um, and, and um, they've got a modified root system as a result of that. But when it comes to um, uh, trees and what we value, and, and you heard a lot from Shelley today that just reinforced the fact that it's the above ground parts of trees that we really have such high value, or the, that we accredit with all sorts of values. Um, the, the shade elements, the, the, the uh, oxygen breathing, and all sorts of things, all those things. That, that the, there's so much attributed to the above ground parts of trees, but at the end of the day, the investment in trees has got nothing to do with what's above ground. There's a bit of maintenance that happens, but by and large, the investment is what's happening in the ground, that space. Um, and the, the way things function in the ground is um, an important part of it. Now, I did have a whole lot of notes that I was looking at. I just need to refresh myself here <laughs> on, um, on some points. Um, I don't know if you forget about that. Um, I just want to move on because one of the things that we, we order, in order to understand what's going on for trees and what's happening with root systems, this below ground area, the best analogy I can think of is, treating, is actually it's like a stomach, like a human stomach, except it's our stomach inside out. Trees, trees, the, the tree's stomach is, is um, uh, oops, sorry, I hit the wrong thing here, whoops. Um, the, it, it's shaped really to, to, to the areas where uh, there's, there's um, shaded areas, the pink zones here, are, are really the zones of influence essentially around a root system. In undisturbed soils, in our sandy soils, we have root systems that pr predominantly look a bit like this. Um, so we've got you know, deep sinker roots, some, some preatophytes here, we'll have roots that go down to a water table, that sort of thing. But by and large, that's, you know, it's like this, and we have really shallow root plates, very wide sinker roots that actually stabilise the tree. In heavier soils, it's a bit like this, and very similar to the, some of the diagrams we've been looking at this morning. But, um, and the, the, the pink zones of influence here are, um, you know, that's where essentially all the, ju the gastric juices for a tree uh, are, are growing. All the bacteria, the mycorrhizal fungi, all those associations, they're all happening in this space. Um, and it's, it's, a it's a really complex system that goes on here. Um, it, a good, you know, there's, uh, the, the way, uh, the way um, uh, roots actually will, will, um, will generate it is, um, let me see, just stop for a second, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself in my thoughts on what I'm saying. Um, what, I, what I wanted to get to is that in, in um, undisturbed soils we have root systems that, that very much look like this and once we start moving into urban spaces we actually create a, a very different way that roots function and operate. Um, you can see here the, you know, that typical undisturbed. Once we move into, into uh, more residential zones what happens is our sinker roots actually disappear because of the, the, the nature of the, the, the soil, that's, the, the layers of soil that we put in, the compacted soils that we put in there. The, the, the paths that roots, roots, that roots follow are these aerated zones where we've dug trenches, we've put in services, we've done all those sorts of things. And so we have a root system that actually, um, uh, it, it it's so modified that it, it represents nothing like what would be a natural type of root system. Um, and the uh, the, the, the influences that are, that are occurring around this that, um, just, just make the whole circumstance very, very different. The, um, uh, I'll just sorry, I'll move on to the next one. But part, of, part of what we need to understand here is, well, not need to understand, but just breaking up some of the what's, what's a myth and what's not a myth, uh, what's factual about the things that we're doing. And in a lot of cases, the way we've, we've done things in the past, um, or in the past, <coughs> Uh, have, have been, they've served us well in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. Um, but as we've come into the 90s and, and now, uh, th in this period of time, there's a whole lot of things that have been flipped and re-challenged. And I, I think we also need to look at, well, what are some of the base, uh, b the base information that we're um, basing our decisions on? And some important differences to be aware of. Um, Things like we tend to think that big, the tree, you know, old trees or big trees are tough and hard and, and, uh, and, and strong and gnarly. Well, they're no different to people. As they get older, they become more frail. They might become more reliant on, on things being done in a different fashion. Um, that, that there, if there's a water table, the tree will find it. Well, no, it won't. Um, by and large, the, 
the, the, the genetic code, if you like, of how a root system is going to grow is, is completely distorted by the, by the very nature of the soil that it's growing in. We change those things dramatically. Um, and that seriously affects how a tree can actually do what it was going to, or what it would naturally be inclined to do. So we've got very strong influences that we can manage. It's no different to engineering a soil. We should, you know, we can engineer the way that roots, roots actually um, function in the in the ground. Um, that the trees, oh, um, well, they know where pipes and septic, septic, <laughs> septic tanks and those sorts of things are. Well, no, they don't. It's just by pure chance. The roots just grow to places. They just take advantage of circumstance and they'll proliferate where things are good. Um, and that urban soils act like the same as native soils, just add a bit of topsoil and a bit of mulch. Now, that, you know, it's a real myth. There's, there's, it's far more sophisticated than that. And I, you know, part of today is to really appreciate just what those differences are. And some of the examples you'll get from Tim and from Vic will be a clear indication of that. That native trees will always outperform exotics. Um, it's just there's really no evidence to actually support that whatsoever. Um, it's, it's just not true. It's, uh, we sort of misunderstand what, that, that, where that's really going. Endemic trees and they're best suited to, to sites development. Well, you know, if nothing changed, if we could develop a site and, and change nothing, well, yes, they would be. But we change things to such an extent that we have a really severe impact on, on root systems and how they grow, where they grow. Um, that uh, urban trees are no urban trees, a number of those are no different to, a, to managing a forest. Again, they're totally different things. We, we should, we're getting ourselves confused if we think they're the same. The terminology is as if they were the same, an urban forest, but there are, an urban forest is very different in, by nature, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, finished levels and natural levels, by and large, what, you know, quite often we're looking at plans and we think, oh, it's all going to end up back at the same level again, not appreciating that there's a whole lot of work that gets done that destroys roots just to box out and create the, the subgrades that are required for that very service. A surface, um, and that selecting the right species is going to come all, overcome all problems is the biggest furphy we've ever been sold. Um, it's the, it's just so far from the reality. At the end of the day, it's the it's the soils and the and the so, the things we do below ground that strongly strongly dictate how a tree is going, how a tree root system is going to develop, and how suitable it's going to be to that site. That's you know, part of this is around how you know, it's, it's a really complex area. Uh, that takes a, uh, a fair level of understanding. So if you believe all these other things, you've probably been sold a pup, basically. Um, and you know, for it to be, for, you know, for in planning, design and infield really requires smart thinking and decision making that's based on facts and some of the evidence. And you've heard this a few times today, there needs to be evidence-based science or evidence-based uh, input data that's actually being used around the decision that we're making. Uh, and it is the decision making that's that's um, important here. So, so th some things to just off the top here that, that that seem to underpin, I think, just challenge some of the basic thinking that we have, and, and just recognising that a tree without foliage, um, that, that well, a tree can have foliage, but it it can't survive without a root system. A root system is the imperative. You can cut the top off this thing a number of times; it'll keep growing. Um, but the, the, the root system, the, the, the leaves are just the solar panels essentially that energise the system to work. It, it just keeps a, the root system essentially functioning and being able to provide what it needs to provide. It, it's, it's that energy source to keep the system going. Um, various, various species sometimes, but quite often, the, again, just influenced by soil types and soil profiles. You can have dimorphic root systems develop. So root systems that are a second tier of roots can appear. Sometimes there's a water table, sometimes it's just a change in the, in the nature of the soil in that profile. Um, trees, uh, tree, the same species of tree will grow different roots, different types of roots, uh, physically very different in different soil types. Um, uh, that, yeah, that in itself is something we don't sort of recognise that, that well. But it's really important when you start looking and analysing what's going on with roots. Roots, by and large, they don't compete with gravity. So every, all the branching things, all the, all the above ground parts of a tree, they're competing with gravity. And so they, they, they grow and they structure themselves very differently. Below ground, a tree just grows to perfection, basically. And if it doesn't, by not having to compete with gravity, it, it can actually grow in a very different fashion. And physiologically, you can look at some of the cross sections. Not, I won't do that today, but uh, it's, it, it's very, very different the way the, the roots develop and grow and the, the, the capacities that they have to do what we, what we do. <coughs> I'll just go back there. The other, um, as, 
as um, Simon was referring to before, just the secondary growth actually. So absorption roots grow and then eventually, if that's really terrific, um, it's, the, it's the process of roots growing from being a fine root and it's the secondary growth that grows around it that gets to be as big as my wrist type of thing. That expansion is what can um, do a lot of lifting, basically. Um, and if you've got a hard surface and a hard surface and a root gets in between, you know, it's just going to push them up. Uh, and it's that expansion that does that. Monocots don't do that. Palms and things like that, they have lots of fine roots, but they don't have that constant expansion that causes a problem. Um, and so some of the, um, the qualities that Simon was talking about in terms of lifting are uh, related to those sorts of things. Um, but modern arboriculture is, is really your best partner in interpreting what's going on in managing trees, and particularly root zones. Um, and so I'd just like to run through a few things here about that. What we need to understand as, as in, in modern arboriculture is um, and, you know, the soil types, the soil profile, and particularly the top metre or so, which is where most of 90% of our, our root occupation is in that zone. A lot of it's even closer to the surface. Um, and uh, top soils and subsoils, the status of those and how they're, they're actually going to influence how a root or how the tree it might migrate and, and grow its roots through there. Avail water availability, water quality, we've heard about all those too. And, and, and trees and tree roots actually are, are in sync here with, what, with some of our outcomes. We can use them to take out nutrients, we can use them to actually express water. Um, there's all sorts of things that are magic about tree roots that um, uh, are just extraordinary. The, 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 the hydrology of a tree is, is, is something that really is extraordinary when you can, it'll water itself, it waters the roots themselves actually um, will translocate moisture to themselves so they can actually move through the soil. Um, they can actually, they also have exudates and things that they'll put out there that'll feed the microbes that influence the rest of the soil. Um, so that there's a lot of complexities around that that we uh, need to understand that, that change from site to site. Um, compaction is the probably one of the, the, the biggest enemies of trees, compacted so or roots I should say. Compacted soils are um, you know, without air. Water without air for trees is toxic. It's not, it's not as though water is the big, the big solution here. There needs to be a balance and there's got to be air in the soil for roots to actually be able to permeate or to, to uh, move through. Um, and what this is showing here is that there's the, at the end of the day, poorly graded sands which is um, uh, quite often it's the residue really of, of uh, some of the construction that goes on, um, is about the only thing that can, that can handle being, comp or it can be compacted and roots can physically penetrate through that. Uh, but most of our other, other uh, uh, sandy material, whether it's clay, well graded sand, sandy, what is it, sand, uh, sandy silty clay and clay, um, by the time they get to the compaction levels that are required for most construction, Roots can physically not even get through them, so they don't. They don't go. They don't go through them. They go above or they go below them. Um, understanding site limitations is um, the thing. We talk about death by a thousand cuts. Well, you know, here's a situation where, um, and this is Museum Street for those that. Um, well, it's not on display now, uh, but um, you know, here's, well, there's been upgrades. Services have been upgraded. The paving, the the, the pavement areas have actually been upgraded. And so five, ten years apart, some of these things are happening, and finally there was an upgrade. And you know, here's a tree, still looking like a not a bad agonis, um, old, beautiful old trunk, but there's not much of a root system left, but it was still surviving. It was enough for it to still survive. Um, but you know, was it a tree in good health and stable? Absolutely not. Um, but but you know, understanding just what we're doing and, and how interpreting these sorts of things, it, it, it's really important modifying the modifications that we, um, we carry on. And at, at times we lose control of this because these things just happen one year after another, different people authorise certain things to happen. You know, we don't really give it much thought, but uh, at the end of the day, so stuff like this happens you know, not infrequently. Uh, and understanding where, that, that uh, what a tree needs to grow and survive and the, the volume that's required here for, for just a standard tree to um, uh, for it to be successful in the landscape. Um, these sorts of things can be done, but you know, we're, I've, just, I've deliberately drawn this as a bit of a box because at the end of the day, we, all we're doing is, is, is you know, creating a circumstance for roots to grow where we want them to grow. We can actually do these things, protect infrastructure at the same time and have um, a, a very strong influence over 
what it is that we need and the cost of putting it in. Uh, uh, there's more about that uh, a little bit later on. But understanding the phenology of trees too, that we impose on them, uh, the seasonal factors that come into play and um, yeah, project time versus tree time, that's a big one. You know, we, a tree, you, you, you scratch a tree, and, or, or sorry, I scratch myself here and it bleeds a bit, I put a band out on there and a couple of weeks later it's all gone and all fixed. But for a tree, that could be a two year exercise to actually um, respond to those sorts of things. Um, we've got a, pre a project that's you know, it's running a bit late, oh, we're going to have to plant the trees in the middle of summer. Um, well, whoopee do. You know, is, is, there's no implication? Yes, there is. There's a whole lot of implications and the cost of those implications just aren't recognised. Um, so the, and the organics being the, we, we have a lot of organics in our soils. We introduce all these wonderful, lush, rich type soils. Um, but the organics, the, the, the carbon in those, it, 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 it decays, it changes. And so it changes the nature of the soil. It changes the, the ability for, for it to drain, the permeability changes. All these things, you know, we've got a lot of science that says this is really good right, right now but we don't have a lot of record of, well, what happens over time and how much does that really stuff up the whole system? Because quite often we end up with layers that are almost impermeable because of all the, uh, all the, the um, 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 decomposition that's occurred and things have shrunk and they've done all sorts of other things as well. But amenity expectations is another one here too. We're um, at the top of the green curve here for a tree. Um, more often than not, this, this, this here is probably about 30 odd years when you get up to what's a relatively mature tree. Um, and then you know, for, the, for the next, there's decades usually, sometimes it's hundreds of years, but that, that tree just sort of retains a level of maturity. And some of them get big and old. And eventually they become sort of veteran trees and they start to decline. And, and there comes a point where the cost of maintenance for this tree gets to a point where, well, do you keep it or do you, or do you cut it down? Um, and for some trees, they become historic trees in very significant places and we, we spend this, we do it, because it's, the tree's worth it uh, for a lot of reasons. But most of the time, we cut them down. Uh, and that, that's a natural life cycle. But we tend to, there's a you know, sort of a push, if it's got a bit of green stuff on it, you don't touch it. Yeah, that's, you know, Arboriculture doesn't really talk that language, it just says it's a fact, here it is, these are the circumstances, what do you want to do? But for a building, it's, it's Strange, isn't it? A building actually, its highest value is right at the very beginning and it depreciates over time. Its maintenance costs escalate over time. Usually we get to this point and nobody hesitates to bulldoze it and start again. Um, we've got other drivers there too, but... Um, and, yeah, risk and risk management and it will come into play here too as to, you know, how do we keep... But quite often we actually, uh, we, we, we do things during this period where we're going to retain a tree in particular. Um, and what we've done is the tree still looks okay, it was going to last another 50 to 70 years, but we've taken it from here to there. We don't question that, we don't realise what we've lost, basically it's time. Sometimes we've lost you know, 50, 100 years of amenity life um, because of some of the things that we do. Um, and size does matter. Now this is it's not really to do with root zones, but just to recognise the fact that um, quite often we're, we're, we're really misjudging what's going on here. You know, small trees, crepe myrtles, paper bucks, those sorts of things, are quite, they're, they're very common. We see a lot of those because there's smaller spaces. We think we've got smaller areas, so let's put in smaller trees. But they're almost sold as being, you know, that these, this is going to give us canopy cover that's consequential. Just be mindful, these smaller trees, for, you, you can be, you're needing sometimes 20 or 30 of these smaller trees to make up for what would be equivalent of a chewet. Um, uh, sometimes it's uh, you know, 10 or 20 of those just to be equivalent to a jacaranda or a medium sized tree. So small, medium and large trees, we, we need to rethink what we're talking about here because when it comes to you know, canopy cover, um, 20, 20 times a, a small tree to get one that's a decent tree, phew, you, know, you sort of start questioning that. So the, but the question is, well, how do we manage this below ground, I guess? And it starts here, Qual understanding what a quality root system is, is a big, big part of um, how we can um, address things really in the future. That's, we need, there's a lot of things that need to change here, nursery practices um, in, in how we generate our trees and, and the quality control. As Simon was saying earlier with engineers and the pavement, we've got to be watching a process and make sure that every part of that process is actually being done as we intend it. We can specify it, but if it's not being carried out the way we, we want it to be carried out, 
we've got nobody else to blame but ourselves. Um, that's being a bit negative, but you know, it's it's just a, a reality. That's the sort of thing that we can change. It's the, there's a uh, an ability to do that. We're talking about species selection before before you even think about a species. We need to understand site conditions. We need to understand the type of soil, that what the tree needs, whatever it might, what, whatever that species might be, um, for it to be successful in this in the, in that landscape, in that part of the landscape. The time constraints, the amenity requirements. You know, all these are all things that you, you, if without understanding that, you can't really start picking a species. To think that you can just accept the offal of road construction and all sorts of things thrown down there in the middle of the road and say, there you go, horticulture, go and sort it out. I'm sure you can find a species that'll grow in that and that's okay. It's bullshit. We, you can't, we can't accept that sort of stuff. We've got to you know, re, just reignite <laughs> what is our profession to, to look at these sorts of things, understand it's actually more sophisticated than, than just throwing a, a, a tree in the ground. You know, what we mostly want is look something like this on the left hand side obviously, <laughs> but what we mostly get is this brook old tree. Um, and really the reason we, this happens, and I, I guess a big part of this, is that they're all, it's a chain of independent, interdependent events that is part of a tree. You saw the, the, the mosaic, if you like, uh, and Adelaide and the process that needs to be gone through. Um, and, and part of that, we see that as being part of a process, but that's, a lot of that's just an approvals process to get to the point of being able to be able to put a tree in the ground and how, where, what is the space, where is it able to go. Um, and it is complex and that's fine. And, and, but today is really about, well, once you get that approval, how do, what do we do then? How do we, how do we actually get these, these um, trees to be successful in the ground? And, and a lot of it is, you know, part, is, is having the, um, the information that's up in these, the design and the, and the documentation stages being a lot more specific. We can't rely on, we can't just say, oh, here's your trees and stuff, and uh, landscaper, just go and plant those over there and, or, and, and ask your bobcat operator to you know, make sure he doesn't bulldoze too many roots off that tree. And, um, you know, but, but we're not being specific enough in, in what it is that needs to be done um, at this level. So with the instructions that flow down are, are just not adequate at the moment. I think there's just so much work that we need to do in this space. And that's what today's about, just recognise it's really important that we get the right detail up there, there's collaboration that's needed to get that detail so that you've got instruction for, for the very people that are doing these things to do it the way they are meant to do it. And as with the road construction, it needs to be overseen. All the way through that process it needs to be overseen to see that it's done as it's meant to be done. Otherwise, we keep on getting the same old stuff here. That chain's broken. But if we, and it's only, you know, any one of those links being broken in a chain is going to result in a really poor landscape at the end, a poor outcome. The sad thing is, oh, oops. The sad thing is here that, that um, this is happening three, seven, ten years later. And we're not associating that with, any, with this process. This process is the, is the thing that has given us this outcome because it, you know, we're all, we're, everything's being assessed back to a dollar and it's being broken down to a contractor for this and a, a contract for that. And we're all so focused on all those little bits and pieces um, that individually it's, it's, you get good value for money, but as a whole, it's a disaster. That's, and we're just, we keep repeating this. And if, it, if this wasn't happening pretty much 70% of the time here in Perth, I wouldn't be here. But after 35 years of doing my stuff and talking the same sort of thing about how, you know, we've got to help change this, change this, change this. Um, we've, cha we've actually given up in, in trying to sort of, not given up, but we've come up with a model that's called Civic Trees that really is about being able to recognise how all these links in the chain that need to be put together, we work with you to develop these, um, to, to, to develop, to go through that process so that all the, all the boxes that ticks, you've got strong links in that chain and we guarantee an outcome at the end of it. And that's a, that's a package and some of us you might want to talk to um, some people here today to, we can do some presentations for you as to how to get that happening. But keeping the chain strong, a bit like chalk and cheese in many ways about um, opinions and, and how this, you know, what is it that's going to actually make a difference. Um, and um, 
one big ticket here, I think, that and it's sort of almost been, I think Simon's alluded to it to some extent too, is is just recognising absolutes and variables. And um, there, there are various professions, I think, we need to start looking across at each other and starting to reconcile some, some, uh, some of these differences that are just natural differences. They're not actually a problem. Um, they're a problem because we keep saying to other people, stay in your lane. You know, don't, don't step outside of your level of expertise. I think it's become pretty clear that we all have to have a, we have our own strengths, but we also have to have a certain level of knowledge about the other party and what they're doing, and that's a shared process. That sort of collaboration is imperative. Um, and, but th th there's a difference here, the absolute versus variables. Absolutes, the you know, accountants and what have you, you know, Two plus two is four, no problem. That's, and that's a rule. You, you apply that rule across everything. Um, and, and it stays true. And for a lot of engineering, a lot of the engineering things that we do, we rely on that, those truths being exercised. And you, you can put those rules across all sorts of things, a ruler across this, this and that. But there's also um, uh, the area of, of, um, of variables where, in horticulture in particular, medicine's another one. The, they're, they're all, the, there's, uh, the, the truths are they're eked out by actually doing a whole lot of experimentation around things, collecting data to show this is what happens over time, this is how these things actually come together. And then you've got a level of truth that you can say, yes, bang, this is a fact and this applies. Otherwise we end up, and we, which we do in a lot of research in horticulture and medicine, uh, it's refined back to we end up looking at things, there are so many variables that we annihilate or obliterate a whole lot of them so that we're down to one or two and then we can say, in, you know, we did this trial, and in this, under these circumstances, this is true. In and, and for, from from an engineering perspective, that's great, but you can't apply it to everywhere else. We end up with lots of these little facts, if you like, about the circum under these circumstances, this is true. Under these circumstances, that's true. In horticulture and arboriculture, we're juggling these balls. There's hundreds of them all the time because it's a dynamic living system that we're dealing with, and. That's, that's how we, we, know, we need to collect the data and have a bit of a history to be able to make up or, or create the right sort of, we've got the information to make the good decisions. We can base it on data, not on just opinions or, and theories and that sort of thing. There are two ways of, of actually doing things, so there's the absolutes and the variables. Um, and for us, the soils, and I was meant, you know, already been talking about that, but the characteristics, they change with a wet soil and a dry soil. Um, they can change characteristics of our, our, our Pindan soils and uh, up north, rock hard when they're dry, or like, almost like soup when they're wet. Uh, trees fall out of the ground with cyclones and stuff up there because it, the hard ground has turned to soup. And, they, and they, you know, there's lots of things we can do to um, accommodate those differences, but our sandy soils, by and large, whether they're wet or dry, most of our sandy soils hold a, a, a certain level of their, their structural characteristics. You know, very different features, and so we need to understand those when in, from, a, from an arboricultural sense in, in how trees remain stable in the ground. Or mat organic matter, we've already talked about that. Um, air and the, um, the influence of air, you know, we focused on water, but I think a lot of our, our studies, we need to start looking at where air is, because air is going to be a big part of how we can actually get root systems to very much follow paths and do things that we need to do. So air's a, uh, a, big, a big area for me of um, further research that needs to be done and compaction we already understand. Uh, and just uh, I guess one example of how this difference if you like is being applied here, you know environmental science is really good at interpreting a community of trees and the, and the, um, the con that context in a natural setting, whereas modern arboriculture is really good at interpreting the individual needs of trees and its context is in the, a unique urban setting. That's, uh, they're, they're um, from, a, from a, 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 um, a, an environmental science type or environmental type of perspective, you can, have some, you can create a lot of rules. When you look at a big expanse of forest or wetland or something, you can apply some rules about how, how water is going to affect this and how water level changes are going to affect this. And, and you know, there's a number of things, that those rules can be put into play that make sense. But you apply those rules in an urban setting and they, they don't make sense, they're just a context. They're only one part of a, a number of things that come into play when you're dealing with an individual tree. And arboriculture, that's, that's its speciality. It's looking at what are the in, what's the circumstance for an individual tree. It's not necessarily as part of a forest, but it can be. 
it more often. It's just part of a streetscape. It's living alone. It's starting its own whole new ecology, basically. And the swales and things we're talking about, that you know, the, the ones that look ugly, the ugly ones, I like that, Simon, the ugly ones, um, are in fact the very best ones that we can be doing. We've got, we can introduce trees into these so that they are. Um, that a tree, that, you know, we've seen the, the roots of trees being destructive. We can actually do lots to uh, engineer these trees into swales so that they actually serve a, a, a much more important purpose. And, and, I, and a, a bit of a jump here in that it goes, a lot of what we're talking about here is, is how we manage these assets that we've got. And I just, um, in lots of our streets, we've actually got power poles and trees actually in the same alignment. They've been given the same alignment. Um, but it's an interesting comparison when you look at power poles, um, their longevity compared to trees. Trees generally sort of live, live longer. Um, but the, you know, the, the, uh, the actual supply and installation of a pole, uh, a power pole and uh, those sorts of things tends to be around about you know, five or 10 grand for the installation of a tree, really. The, what we're, what we're really spending our money on is here. Because with that space, that a that's our asset for a tree. It's not this. Because th if we get this right, we can have generations of those being put in. That's what we value, which was mentioned earlier. We value this, but at the end of the day, the investment for a tree is all in here. And we've got this, the, this and you'll, hear, you'll see some examples, case studies this afternoon, um, as to how we can actually do this, how we can protect infrastructure in the course of doing this as well. I've got some other slides to talk about that a bit. But you know, this, if all we, we focus on is actually getting this right, and instead of being thinking that, oh, let's, let's put in a, a small tree, it only cost us $15 instead of a, um, a big tree that might cost us $200, I mean, that's nothing. This is, we're talking about trees here that quite often these trees are worth their amenity value in our urban spaces. For some of them, it'll be five or $600 per year that they're valued at. For some trees, it'll be millions of dollars per tree. So you know, there's, there's lots of values we can put up here, but that, that value is nothing if we don't have this, if we don't sort this out. If, and we can, we can engineer this so that it does work. Gee, that's quick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, any, and I've said on that. Um, so some the successful integration, um, the art of the possible is the the things that we can do, and we will just brush across quickly now too. But drought proofing of trees, cyclone proofing trees, uh, wooded expansion to include trees, uh, water sheeting, and we uh, uh, water sheeting being as as uh, I was alluded to before, we can actually do we can have water being sheeted underground to places where we want it. We can use hard stand. You know, the permeable paving can actually be graded so that you can send the water over there and have those zones. You can waterproof, you can drought proof trees by, by having some very clever things that just pick up on natural rainfall and it persists in that area for many weeks or months sometimes instead of dissipating and disappearing in a matter of days. Um, aeration layers are another one uh, and there's lots of other circumstances. And I'll just run through some quick things here and some, you, some of you may know, already know about these but structural soils and how they get developed. There's a huge future in this area um, and, and but we've got to understand the ratios of air as well as what, uh, uh, of what's in the medium. We need those macro pores in there. It's not just filler soils. Um, it's, it's also understanding those macro pores. But that's going to open up a new world of how we can actually have trees and lots of um, root occupation in smaller spaces and bigger trees in smaller spaces. Structural uh, load bearing cells, you, you've, that's fairly common stuff. Uh, but a lot of this is, it's the, the, the science is in on, on how these work, but how they interface with the infrastructure around them is something that can be a bit of a challenge. It's quite often um, what happens beyond here, uh, because we don't close the system off. Most times there's already, a, there's a wall or one area, one or two sides of this that are exposed into native, into, into Mother Earth, if you like, but it's also exposing roots to, to go venture into what was the old type landscape where things have been constructed, sometimes not very well as far as um, uh, potential damage and stuff to them. And roots just taking advantage. Uh, the, the, the roots, uh, the advantage that, the, oh, the reason that roots actually cause damage is because we've invited the roots in there. Not because, not because we've, we've done anything else. We, we've just, we've engineered things so, and we've left these spaces that are a big invite for root. We were talking about condensation before and 
uh, below some of these things. Different, different compounds in the soil themselves actually express by there being a moisture gradient or something that arises as a result of that. Roots just do what they naturally do, proliferate where things are good. Uh, aggregate paving, and this is the, another the principle really of, or the top layer if you like, of uh, permeable paving. Essentially just replacing our sand with aggregate makes a huge difference and there's the asset value, if you like, that results from that is, is extraordinary. You just don't have the, you don't just don't have the lifting and the trip trip hazard problems. They they, they do arise over time, uh, but quite often it's decades away, and and the replacement of um, paving is really very simple. Um, the aerial layers enabling things to, for for soil or for soil build up to occur. Um, again, from an environmental perspective, they sort of say oh, this is just not possible, but. It is, we can do these things, we can create these aeration layers, we can actually have fill around trees that wouldn't otherwise happen. And in our urban spaces, the value of trees is escalating all the time. It's, you know, they're not like a tree out in the bush, these are trees that uh, are worth in many cases, I was saying before, thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars uh, of tree asset. And we can have um, uh, trees actually just being directed to other areas where we want them to have their roots. We don't want the roots here, we want them over there. There's, no, there's, there's all sorts of innovations that we can actually put into play here and stuff that we've been able to demonstrate that it works. It works. You, you know, a tree, city trees for me, they can go out and have a cup of coffee like everybody else. They're city dwellers, why not? And protecting infrastructure, basically most of these, these um, root barriers of this sort just don't work in our sandy soils. Don't worry about it, forget them. Um, compaction trenches do, and um, they're, they're a really effective way of being able to, in our sandy soils, it's only in sandy soils, um, that uh, it, it, it's really effective to stop roots going to the places where we don't want them to go. And we've also uh, brought in a product of ours, which is Fortress 5, um, which is a, a barrier that really it seals the joins between the hard, the, the various surfaces, and stops roots penetrating into those. Um, and, but it's a fully integrated system that we have here because there's just too much rubbish, if you like, or misunderstanding. But you know, being able to have the surfaces correct, uh, understand what that takes, and then applying the product, um, that's part of a, something we, can, we offer anyway. As, um, and in terms of protecting existing trees, um, AS4970, you probably, most people in the room probably already know about that. But um, used correctly, AS4970 is a very useful and powerful tool to manage and protect all assets in proximity <coughs> to existing trees. It, it's, it's, um, it's out there, we think it is, it's a bit of a set up a TPZ, a sort of no-go zone. Well, in actual fact, it's, it's really used correctly. That's not how, what AS4970 is all about. It's about making sure that you know what you're talking about or what you're doing inside that space. It can be used, and in fact, it should be used very constructively to enable build construction to actually happen. And it's also about protecting other assets. When you talk about you know, trying to protect a tree and justifying that, quite often you're actually making, you have to, you have to make sure really that you, the other assets aren't gonna be uh, damaged by virtue of the tree being there. So a couple of examples here, this, um, uh, this at, at um, Cloister's Fig. Um, you know, a few years in the, in the making, but underneath that tree, everything changed. Uh, there's now, there's now a coffee shop, there's uh, decking and uh, a gantry you can see on the left hand side. Uh, all that's been installed, the tree is actually now happier than it ever was. Um, interesting story around that. But for today, some takeaways, and I'll, as time is out now, but my, my thing here is engage modern arboriculture early. You know, bring people to the table with the skills that can deliver, essentially. Um, and that the tree investment is below ground. It's not the above ground bits, the investment is below ground. And, we, and for asset managers, and I know there's a few here today, but it's recalibrating the models that we, that we, um, that we use to, to factor in what is and what isn't an investment. Uh, engage skilled people in modern arboriculture to, to collaborate with professions to help reduce those, that current expenditure, because at the moment I reckon we're spending two or three times more than we need to in overall looking at life cycle asset management as opposed to um, the, uh, we tend to just focus on the budget for this year uh, and that's, that's really distorting the truth of what's going on and we're being a little bit blindsided um, in, in how that's going and I know Tim's got some things to say about that. 
Um, and really look for solutions that embrace and integrate the entire chain of decision making and delivery. That's the planning, the designing, documentation, field operations and, um, and aftercare. And I'm going to just very, before closing off there, thank you. I just want to read my last little bit. Here's my glasses. There we go. Um, so just in closing off, a couple of things. Is, the, the, um, this this um, is a two-stage two thing. So th this conference is here today and in, it's actually on the 4th of August and there'll be notifications on that. But on the 4th of August will be the field day workshop, a guided uh, field day workshop. Uh, that's a follow-up and so that, and that will be looking at some of the WUSID type it, uh, things that have been done. We'll be digging some of those up. We'll be having a look at some uh, works that have already been done, particularly Vic will have some examples there too, but others around Perth, uh, first hand looking at and seeing what's been happening below ground. Sorry, well, it doesn't matter. Um, so it's an opportunity for, for uh, attendees to meet and speak with people uh, that have already had success by adopting some of these site specific approaches. Um, that uh, at this point, you could, if you wanted to follow up where things are going at this stage, our, we do have a web page, our Centre web page. You can sign up on the mailing list and get all the, uh, the latest on that. Um, integrated, integrating trees into engineering spaces in, in high density urban spaces sorry, is, is riddled with uh, root zone management complexities, requires high level of boracultural inputs at all levels of decision making, from planning through to design and documentation, as we've mentioned. Um, and I've perfectly set up Barber Centre uh, to, over, to, to, uh, to be outcomes focused. That's, if there's a change that's happened to Barber Centre in the last five years, it's really just flipping around to being outcomes focused as opposed to just providing a service here. Um, and we're, um, uh, we're looking at well, delivering on that essentially. Um, so, yeah, look, I, for me, I know that applying arboricultural practices as we do at Arbor Centre will result in cost savings, not cost, not extra costs, uh, but low life cycle costs in the management of trees. And uh, I invite you to, or to bring us to your table, basically, in, in the projects that are ahead. So thank you very much. <laughs>